Do you ever tell someone that they have like no concept of time? I mean, that's a little rude, but like, do humans have to have a concept of time? Like who was the first human to come up with the idea that we are like, Frank, you are five decans late for our meeting, you jerk. <laughs> <laughs> the first humans to have a concept of time were the Egyptians. As early as 1500 BCE, or about 3500 years ago, they used sundials and the stars to divide daylight and night into parts. Daytime was 12 parts, 10 hours for the day, and then one hour for dawn and one for dusk. And then night was 12 hours marked by 36 decans, sometimes marked on the inside of coffins, you know, so the dead could tell time in the afterlife. The Egyptians, as you probably know, super into the afterlife. Life. And by the way, just as a little fun fact, Cairo is about at the same latitude as Tallahassee, Florida, Austin, Texas, New Orleans, Louisiana, and the United States. So that means time is going to vary. The number of daylight hours are going to vary throughout the year, just like they would in the American South. So that would mean because there are 10 hours for a day, the length of hours would vary throughout the year in the Egyptian clock. But of course they didn't have like minutes, so it didn't matter if the hours varied a little bit because 3,500 years ago, there were no trains arriving and leaving at like 3.42 PM on the dot. There was no dot, but the Egyptians did have 12 segments for day and 12 segments for night, which is where we get the basis for the 24 hour day. B -b 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 Bingo! So. Why 12? Well, no, this one's pretty good. Counting the number of knuckles on a finger. Base 10, you could use fingers. Base 12, you can use finger knuckles. And also the number of lunar cycles in a year. That counter system is still used today. It's worked for this long, so why not keep it up? Other ancient cultures used other systems too. The ancient Chinese used stars, and then they tried dividing the day into 100 key. I don't know how well that worked out. The Sumerians and then Babylonians like 4,000 years ago used the stars to mark time as well, but they divided time into base 60. Think circles, 360 degrees. That's part of base 60. And so that you know, continues today, but not necessarily in time, except the 60 minute hour. But there are different cultures that use different measurements, of course, at different periods. And the reason that this became the dominant one was likely because of exploration, trade, and religion. There were a lot of European and Arabic scholars who were exploring the world and spreading their time around. Uh, of course, it matters with some religions where prayers have to happen at specific times and specific directions. And over time, our measurement of time got better and better because our astronomy got better and our mechanics got better. And yet there were still no minutes, but of course half and quarter hours. But why would you want minutes? Ugh, why do you need to measure to the minute in like 1509? Michelangelo is not like, I'm charging by the minute to paint this Sistine ceiling. You guys better figure that out. Mechanical clocks came out in the 1600s and they were the first to put minutes on there and maybe, you know, just look blank without them. Just be like, huh, what do we do in between here and quarter hours? Hour. <laughs> and minutes only really mattered to some specific fields like scientists, you know, nerds, <laughs> nerds. We always win. First fantasy was nerdy and now it's everybody. Computers were nerdy. Now everybody has one in their pocket. Comic books were nerdy. It's literally the most highest grossing films ever were from comic books. Even the literal minute y'all use it because nerds are the best. You're welcome. Not that of course it matters because like time, it isn't real anyway, right? Let's kick into it. Of course time is real. I was just testing you. I was messing with you. Of course it's real. Of course, of course, of course. Time is real in that it's measurable. Physical changes happen over time. We talked about this earlier. Anyway. Let's not have a time crisis too here. Let's go outside the clock a little bit. In Dr. Stephen Hawking's book, A Brief History of Time, he uses this graph. The y-axis is distance and the x-axis is time. This is a pretty common method of graphing time in a two-dimensional space. A lot of different cosmologists and astrophysicists use this. And we know from observation that emission to absorption is important. And if you think of it in light, 
time works great for that. An event is something that happens at a particular point in space and at a particular time, so one can specify it by four numbers or coordinates, Hawking writes, X, Y, and Z for space, and then a coordinate for time. That said, the coordinates are only useful when referring to a similar phenomenon in a similar region, because you can't like use Earth hours, minutes, and seconds for something that's happening on Mars. And in fact, the coordinates for time and location on Mars are not relevant when you're talking about where the nearest Dunkin' Donuts is, right? So instead, it's important to remember that time is only relevant to an observer on a local frame. Hawking also writes, Newton's laws of motion put an end to the idea of absolute position in space. The theory of relativity got rid of the absolute time. And that might require a little bit of unpacking. So before Isaac Newton's time in the 1600s, the universe was considered static. Think of it like everything existed inside of a snow globe or a shoebox or a mechanical clock. It's unchanging. Yes, it's in motion, but it doesn't change over time. An object at rest was completely still staying at rest like a donut on a plate. And it only moved when I acted upon it. And this is Newton's laws of motion. It stays at rest until something acts upon it. But it's not actually true, right? The donut is on a plate, the plate is on the earth, the earth is spinning, the earth is going around the sun, the universe is moving and changing and expanding and shifting. So even though the laws of motion threw away the concept of a static universe and threw away the concept of absolute position in the universe, they did start to explore the movements of planets and the relative forces acting upon them. And while the laws of motion that Newton came up with and Newton's laws would be able to define things that are like small, like this coffee mug, they're not going to be so great for things like stars and galaxies. We could calculate forces that are small, but they're endemic to that thing. Now imagine that donut in another galaxy light years away sitting on another plate. We cannot know anything about what is happening with that donut. We don't know about the plate it's sitting on. We don't know if it's on a table or a train or if it's floating in space. We have no absolute position for that donut. Now apply that thinking to time. We have a future and a past, and that would look like this. This is a Minkowski space-time light cone diagram. Kind of looks like an hourglass, pretty funny. The hypersurface is the imaginary now, and that event is at the middle where the hypersurface meets the light cone. That is not Earth in the middle, that is just an event. Sure, maybe that is the donut, any fried dough. You want a Claire style, you want a churro, awesome, whatever. All donuts have different time cones. That's what that's called, or light cones. They're different calculations. Don't try and calculate them all because you would shatter like an iPhone 5, my friend. There is no such thing as absolute position because we can't know everything about everything and there's no such thing as absolute time for the same reason. My time is not the same as this donut's time. And this donut's time is not the same as the time of a SpaceX satellite or Mars. Time is about perception, not in a psychological way, but based on the illusion of place, of our event. We know this is true because of space exploration. Einstein's special relativity says that the faster something moves, the slower time is going to move for that thing. It is not an illusion, it's physically slower. Astronauts age slower. It's not super measurable because they're not moving that much faster than we are. You know, Scott doesn't feel younger when I talk to him or anything like that. GPS satellites though, they have atomic clocks on them, super accurate clocks. And those super accurate clocks need correcting because they are moving faster than the atomic clocks on the ground. Time actually moves slower for satellites providing you GPS than it does for the person actually using the signals. You know, relatively speaking, <laughs> pardon the pun. And if you think about it that way, our planet is also moving. And so our sense of time is warped in that way. And yet there's no way to measure time without moving. It's all relative to where we are. If you could somehow find a way to be completely still within an expanding universe that is inflating as we speak, it would be a different time frame than the Earth as it flew by. And on a universe scale, it's a bit easier to explain because time does go into the same direction all the time. Oh gosh, I've said time so many times. <laughs> You've probably seen one of the many videos on the second law of thermodynamics and I'm not gonna be as great as Henry or the other Psycomers that have all covered this. I've even covered it myself. I'll just say this. The second law of thermodynamics 
which if you want to know more, go look it up, says that entropy will increase in a closed system, period. I mean, it can be more complicated than that, but that is what it's saying. And what we think of as time is connected to that entropy. Entropy in all the existence of all the universe has never decreased. So time will continue to flow, called the arrow of time, from past into the future. Think about that documentary, the historical documents of Galaxy Quest, and they used the thing called the Omega-13, and it rearranged matter, but it had to do it for all matter and energy in the whole universe instantly. Wow, was that thing way more powerful than you thought, right? By Grabthar's hammer, whoa, you know? And it would take that matter and energy and restore it to a slightly lower entropic state. Easy, 13 seconds of, of whatever. The amount of energy required for that, again, astonishing. Truly astronomical, but interesting to think about. I don't wanna be accused of telling time tales outside of time school. So I'm not the only one thinking about this. Obviously, we can look at theoretical physicist Carlo Rovelli's assertion that time doesn't exist. It's not real because, quote, there's no time variable in the fundamental equations that describe our world. So there is no entropic clock, you know, that started at zero and counts up to make the arrow of time. Instead, we use our biology and our experiences to tell time and we can infer it from the changes happening around us. We try and force the universe into our puny brain time framework and instead take Hawking's events like donuts. Even though you see a donut, the donut is actually changing over time. It's not a rock. It's not some kind of imaginary object like a box that never changes. Everything changes over time. Stars, space, rocks, everything. They're all in flux. We only experience it as slowly changing because of our perception of time. It's imperceptible to us with our puny brain holes, but we link cause and effect along this timeline. Yeah, it's a lot. I feel like I've been going and going and I wanna make sure everybody follows what's happening. There's no such thing as absolute time. Time is relevant only for the observer, whether that observer is a GPS satellite, a donut on a plate, or Alpha Centauri. All of those experience time differently, and that's fine. Relativity takes care of that. So we take this idea of individual time, or you know, no universal time, no absolute time, and we take that perception into a whole new place. Because what we're trying to do when we explain time is fit nature into a perfect box. What the Egyptians were trying to do when they took the 12 hour day and 12 hour night was to understand how the earth was moving in such a way that you could make a clock or make a way to, to talk about it. But it's again, nature that you're trying to put in a perfect little box and nature doesn't do that. Even cesium clocks, atomic clocks that are supposedly so, so accurate will lose a second every 10,000 years, which to you and me, whatever. To the Earth, 10,000 years, nothing. Based on time frame, it's important. So time that we have now is good for humans, bad for geology, worse for astrophysics. There was an ancient Chinese philosophy of time by uh, somebody named Ying, and they talked about it as multiple timelines. There's no such thing as a privileged present. This was ancient China, and they're talking about the same thing we were talking about earlier. There's no such thing as now. Time are relationships between events and situations. Change doesn't happen over time. Time and change are the same, right? Weird. It's not the best system, it's still flawed. Why? Because time doesn't matter. So if you're still with me and you're not in the comments talking about how I'm a crazy person, time is a relationship between an event and a situation, just like Yi Hing said. So it is in fact still flawed because time is only important for the observer. And Einstein said that the dividing line between the past, present, and future is an illusion. There is no such thing as the past, present, and future. Mathematically, the equations work both ways. You can move forward or backward with this mathematical equation in time. Time is only relevant to the event, the observer. And this brings us to the idea that it's easier to quantify the universe. It's easier to put it on paper with a graph or a diagram, like for example, a block universe. The block universe is everything that has ever happened, everything that will happen, and it's all within the block universe, even you and me right now, and also then and tomorrow. <laughs> the block universe is everything everywhere that has ever happened, and we know it has. 
So thank you for joining Nebula. <laughs> because you already have, right? I mean, we're still on the arrow of time thing, so let me explain. Nebula is a streaming service that I helped start with some of the best educationalist creators that you will love on YouTube. So what we do is we put our content on Nebula too, but we do it without ads, more or less, and by joining you support us directly. That's right, no worrying about algorithms, subscriber counts, pre-rolls, little banner things that pop up. Just imagine creators that you love all in one place, all together making cool stuff because that's what Nebula is. And we own the service, so we get to mess around and try things that we would never be able to do out in the rest of the internet. Like for example, original programs about title sequences or the history of synths or a reaction show where we explain 90s things like Limp Bizkit to Gen Z or Alex. <laughs> and all of these things exist on Nebula. And to join Nebula, just join CuriosityStream with this promo code. You will get Nebula for free because CuriosityStream loves Nebula. They love it so much that it's actually a better deal to join CuriosityStream and get Nebula for free. They agreed to give us 26% off of their annual plans, the best deal anywhere on the internet. We fact checked it. And for less than $15 a year, a little over a dollar a month, you're gonna get both CuriosityStream and Nebula. You're gonna support creators you love directly. And not only can you get the shows that I mentioned earlier about Alex and about working titles and about the history of World War II and all sorts of other things. You also get David Attenborough, Chris Hadfield telling you about hummingbirds or space or Derek Muller telling you about the internet, all sorts of other amazing big budget documentaries. It's such a good bundle. To get all of this, use the link in the description. Go to curiositystream.com slash trace. It's super easy. Use the promo code trace. You're going to get 26% off of the gear of both services. Plus, this is episode three of five of this series, but you could have watched the whole series already if you had Nebula, because the first day of every series from now on, I am going to put them up on Nebula that same day. So episode one through five on Nebula from day one, episodes two, three, four, and five will air on YouTube every other day after. So you already wanna know about the end of time? You can do that if you're on Nebula. And you can feel good about it because clicking that link directly helps me keep this channel going. So thanks, but let's keep going on this time series, huh? Whew. So for more on the Block Universe, come back on Monday. I know, I'm such a tease. Subscribe, more time explanation tomorrow. It's gonna be so crazy. My brain hurts, I'm running out of coffee. I don't know what to do. Share this with a friend whose brain doesn't hurt or bothers you because they were late that one time. And you can be all like, time is relative, Carl. Doesn't really matter. Anyway, thanks for watching. I am Trace and I will see you in the future.